All right. Uh, oh, let me stop that. So we left when we left off. Uh, we left off here with the video. We were talking about how the video is a way to convert uh, carbonyls, either alkene. Uh, I'm sorry, aldehydes or ketones into alkenes. And we talked about the conditions, right? It says you need an alkyl halide, you need a strong base, you need triphenylphosphine. So we talked about the first step is to make the, the uh, synthesis of what's called an illid, right? That's this species here that we had highlighted with a positive and a negative charge adjacent to one another. And it's that carbon from the illid that's going to replace oxygen in the carbonyl, right? So we talked about for the illid synthesis, first you do a SN2 substitution on triphenyl, I mean, on a, your alpha halide, that was this, right? And then we talked about how the base, the the, the um, base, what it's used for is to come in and to do a proton transfer so that you can put that negative charge on carbon and get your illet. So the illet is what's going to actually attack uh, your carbonyl, all right? So... Let me fix that charge right quick. I need to get my stylus. So now we're going to talk about the next phase of the reaction, which is taking that illet and attacking the carbonyl <clears throat> and eventually getting to your uh, alkene product. All right. So that's the that's the second phase. So the first phase is, <clears throat> excuse me, illet synthesis. The second phase is uh carbonyl attack. Right. So that so and again this is a this for a long time the illet uh attack on the carbonyl was studied and it was believed that it went through this particular intermediate that I'm going to show you but Further research kind of proved that that intermediate didn't exist, but we, I'm still going to go that way because it's the easiest way to understand the reaction uh, and understand what happens in the course of the reaction. But for a long time, it was believed that this was the uh, definite mechanism for alkene synthesis through Vitic, through the Vitic reaction. But you know, there there have been a lot of studies done that that kind of proved that the illet that the attack of the illet didn't result in this intermediate that I'm going to show you, but it actually went through a different type of transition state and a different intermediate on its way to product. But we're going to look at the classical mechanism uh, because, it, again, it's the easiest way to understand what happens in the reaction. So let's do that. So we have our, our carbonyl. Uh, I'm just going to take a, which one am I using? I'll take the aldehyde. So I'm going to take the aldehyde here. And I'm going to re react that with the illet. Remember, this is negative, and then this is that's positive. All right. So, again, everything goes back to I don't care like, how far you go in chemistry. It doesn't matter if you're studying in grad school to get a PhD. It doesn't matter if you're studying it for, for a master's. It doesn't matter if you're finishing it in May. Every reaction that's polar <clears throat> is going to come down to where is my nucleophile and where is my electrophile. If it's, if it's intermolecular between two different species, it, that's what it's going to come down to. Where's the nucleophile? Where's the electrophile? So whenever you use carbonyls, it's the carbonyl carbon that's always going to be your electrophile. So the, the reaction is always going to take place right here. Right? That's That dipole between the carbonyl makes that susceptible to nucleophilic attack. So I'm going to take this pair of electrons and push them here and then break the carbon oxygen pi bond. Is that, you've seen this a million times, so this shouldn't be foreign to you. Right now, when I get to the intermediate from that, right, I'm going to have a new bond between the carbonyl carbon. That's negative. 
And then this car, this is the hydrogen is still here from that aldehyde. And then this is the illet carbon. That's still positive. And then those are the two hydrogens are still there. It's kind of sloppy. Let me fix that. Like that. Right. And then so what would you, if I had a negatively charged oxygen next to that phosphorus that's positive? What do you think is going to happen? Do you think those two are going to see each other and like each other? Do you think there's going to be some kind of reaction between them? What do you think? I don't want to be the only one talking today. It's Friday. And I'm always the only one talking. Well, not always, but 99% of the time. <laughs> I think they're going to like each other. You say you think they're... Oh, what did I just do? I'll tighten up. They're gonna they're gonna talk to each other, right? And so this is the in, the intermediate that's debated, right? Because when these two get together, this actually is the driving force for the whole reaction. When you can make this bond between oxygen and phosphorus, it's a very strong bond. Uh, and so now you get an intermediate, a cyclic intermediate that looks like this. So that's that, and then these these are my two carbons. This is the carbon from the aldehyde. And then over here, this is the other carbon from the iliad. Right? And you can see now we're set up because what we want to do is put a double bond between those two carbons. That's the purpose of the reaction. All right? So we're set up now <clears throat> to do that. And this intermediate is what we call an oxo phosphatane. Right. This is it's debated, right? It's been I don't want to say disproven, but that's some research that has shown that this doesn't necessarily exist, at least not in this form. But again, it's the easiest way to, for me to teach you this reaction. All right. So we're gonna roll with it. But I can actually I can give you the <laughs> the paper uh that proposes like a different intermediate and a different transition state. It's it's really a uh, concerted and immediate and uh, approach of your illet and the approach of the aldehyde or like what they call pucker, but I don't want to get into the weeds on that. Uh, but I can, I'll be more than happy to post that if anybody's interested in seeing that uh, in more detail. So now, now how am I going to get a double bond between those two carbons? What can I do? What Which bonds can I break and use, ele use the electrons to make a double bond? Anybody? The carbon oxygen bond. Okay, I can break that. You're right. And I am going to break it. But I'm actually going to take these electrons and put them here. And then uh, by the same token, I can break this carbon phosphorus bond and put those electrons there. And when I do that, I get two things, right? I'm going to draw the first the uh, phosphine oxide, which is look going to look like this. Right? This right here is the reason why this reaction goes because the phosphorus oxygen double bond is super strong. You, you release a lot of energy from, from making that bond. And so the more of that you make, the more starting materials come together to make more product, right? It's following Le Chatelier's principle. If you re recall that from um, G chem part two, right? You can control the equilibrium based on the products. If the products are very stable, then the reactants are going to continue to react so that they can keep up with product formation, right? Uh, so that's that. And this is, again, this is the driving force. That uh, PO double bond. Drives the reaction. The formation of that. Because the more of that you can make, the better. Because it's energetically more favorable. So that's that. And then what else am I going to get? Can you see now up here that there's now going to be a pi bond here between these two carbons because of that arrow that I'm showing from that carbon phosphorus single bond? 
So I'm going to use those electrons to make my alkene. So it's going to look like this. C double bond C. And then I had a H and I had my alkyl group. And then over here is H and H. And that's this is my <clears throat> alkene product. Right? Questions. So the Vedic happens in two phases. The first phase, you set up and go to lunch. And then when you come back from lunch, you hold, you, I don't say holds in because you never just dump in a reagent, but you syringe in your aldehyde slowly and that illet is going to attack it, right? And then that's how you get your alkene. So, but the, again, the actual, this part of the mechanism, like the formation of that oxyphosphatane, it's debated, and I, I'll admit that. But again, it's the easiest way for me to show you what happens. So we're going to keep it. Right? That intermediate is highly, hotly debated, as a matter of fact. Uh, but it makes sense. All right. Questions about the video, about anything there? All right, let's look at uh, the next reaction then. So that's one reaction of carbonyls, right? The Vidic, where you take a alkene and turn it into an, uh, I'm sorry, I keep mixing that up. You take a aldehyde or a ketone and turn it into an alkene. Uh, the other reaction that I want to talk about is right here. It's the... Um, hemiacetal formation now this is not a necessarily a reaction that that's uh how do i put it it's not a it's not a product that's desired but making acetal is very important because sometimes if you're doing a synthesis you can use the acetal as like a protecting group for your ketone or for your aldehyde like if you are doing a synthesis and you want to mask your carbonyl to keep it from reacting with some other nucleophile you can turn it into an acetal to do that. So that's why these are, these reactions are important. So I'm going to cut these out and put them on a separate page, and we're going to walk through this mechanism real quick. And then we're going to talk about the, the imine formation, and we're going to start working through some of these examples. Let me add a page here. I can't believe this semester is already over. That's crazy. Right. So we're going to talk about the hemiacetal because that's easier to think about. Right. And the acetal is a product based on the hemiacetal. You don't have to start over. Once you get to the acetal, you can get you can make the hemiacetal pretty easily uh, by simply taking the hemiacetal and adding another equivalent of alcohol. If you look at the stoichiometry, you can see that this is one mole of alcohol to get you to the hemiacetal over here. And then over here is two moles to get you to the acetal. So once you once you run the reaction once and get the hemiacetal, you can make the acetal from that by just adding in more alcohol. So this is a very uh, simple reaction to think about. Right, all these carbonyl reactions all do the same thing. When you add a nucleophile, you get a tetrahedral intermediate and it's that intermediate that can, you know, either get trapped and stay <clears throat> or it can decompose and eliminate and go back to being a carbonyl. So it just depends on what the reaction is. So for this one, I'm going to write this out. This is my ketone. And I'm going to react that with methanol. One mole. Right. What do you think is going to happen here? Keep in mind. This is my nucleophile, uh, and the carbonyl is always my electrophile. And it's the carbonyl carbon right here that's partially positive in the electrophile. So that's the site that always gets attacked by the nucleophile. So what's going to happen here? Anybody? 
um, an alkoxy group or a tertiary group. Okay, okay. I think you are you're in a ballpark. So let, 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 let's go back. I want you to stay with that thought though. The the which part of the nucleophile is the because you said something about an alkoxy group. So I, I, I think you are on to something. Which part of the uh nucleophile is going to react? Let's let's see where we are there and then we can push forward from there. Like is it the methyl uh, or is it the oxygen? The oxygen. Okay, good, because that's where your electrons are. The nucleophiles give away electrons. So we're going to start right here and push that pair of electrons there. And then we're going to break that carbon oxygen pi bond. Right. So I'm 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 now I'm at I'm at this again. Every time I react a carbonyl with a nucleophile, it, it goes through a tetrahedral intermediate before going to whatever product you're going to make. So over here, I'm going to have this, this. These alkyl groups don't change. I'm going to have O, that's now negative, and then O, H, CH3. All right? That's my that's my intermediate. Now, from that intermediate, I can get to the hemiacetal pretty easily. If you look at the hemiacetal, right, the, that oxygen that's negative, right, becomes an OH. It, oh, let me put my charges in. I'm sorry. Terrible, terrible. How do I how do I get that negatively charged oxygen to become an OH group? Is there a proton within this molecule that I can grab and do proton transfer right next door to it? Yes. Yeah, it's right there on the oxygen. So I just need to grab that. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to grab that. Do a proton transfer and then give those electrons back to oxygen. So now I'm here at my hemiacetal, right? This is the same oxygen that was right here, same oxygen. And then I have OCH3 and then that methyl group right there. So that that's hemiacetal mechanism is probably, that's probably the easiest mechanism we've seen all semester. Right, so that's that. This is the hemiacetal formation. You get you have nucleophilic attack of your alcohol followed by proton transfer. Right, it's a two step mechanism. Right, so then you get to intermediate, and then you just do proton transfer from there. All right, so when we make this is, and this is for the hemiacetal. All when we make the acetal, all right, you don't have to start from zero, right? You can actually add another equivalent of alcohol right to the hemiacetal. The mechanism is a little bit different, but The outcome is what we care about. So when I make the hemiacetal, I just add, I'm sorry, when I make the acetal, I just add a second equivalent of alcohol or another mole of alcohol. Right, I just add another mole of alcohol. And the first thing that happens in this particular case is a proton transfer. So the OH group that's up there is going to pick off that proton from the alcohol. P the pKa of that alcohol proton is somewhere around 16, 17. So it's not super acidic, but it's not horrible either. Right? So you can do that proton transfer with no problem. So now you end up with this as an intermediate. Now that's positive. What have I done to uh, what have I done to that OH group by proton by adding in that proton? Where have we seen that before? Yeah. 
if I turn the OH group into water, what have I done to it? So we've done this a million times, a gazillion times, actually, if that's a real number. Think, of, think about this in terms of substitution, like a SM1 substitution or something like that. Even though you can't, well, never mind. This is not a, a SP2 carbon. So yeah, think about it in terms of substitution. What did I do to OH when I made it, when I turned it into water? If I want to substitute it out with this group right here. You trap the nucleophile? Well, let's think about it. In a substitution, I have a nucleophile. I agree with you there. But I also need a leaving group, right? I need something that to leave in order for the nucleophile to come in. So when I make that OH into water by doing proton transfer, then I, what I've done is I've made it a, a better leaving group. Right, so I'm gonna have one more intermediate in this reaction. So I'm gonna lose this. That's a tertiary, well, secondary carbon. So I'm gonna lose that and convert it into a cation. It's positive. And then I'm gonna put this plus H2O, which was my leaving group, plus OCH3 minus. Now what? I, if I want to turn this into the acetal by adding in the OCH3 to that cation, how would I do it? What would you do to show that? Attacking the... Just attack it, right? The oxygen is negative, and that's a great nucleophile, and I got a, a carbocation right here that I can just come in and attack. Now, there's another plausible way to show this, but I'm, I'm going to leave it. Leave it alone. We're going to go, we're gonna, we'll go with this route right here. Now you have this. <coughs> and this is my acetal. And again, you can start at the hemi acetal, add another mole of alcohol, and that'll that'll get you to the acetal, right? But but everything starts from the first addition of that alcohol to the carbonyl, All right? So this is these are the conditions. If you were to make a flashcard for this reaction, right, you would note the conditions. That's one mole. The stoichiometry here is one mole, so you get the hemi acetal. All right, then when you increase the amount of alcohol, you have access to the acetal. But the stoichiometry is what matters, right? The, the, whether it's one mole or two moles, if it's depending on which set of conditions you, you use, that's, a, that's what's going to determine which product you get. All right, questions about that? All right, we got one more reaction I want to look at, but I'll, I'm not going to look at it. I'm not going to do the mechanism up here because we can. there's a problem where we can go through the arrows for the mechanism, but it's here, right? The amide, I'm not going to go through, right? The amide formation, this, this mirrors uh, ester formation. Right, so if you know that transesterification mechanism, you can you can figure out the amide mechanism no, with no problem. The only difference is there's a, a, a amine as opposed to an alcohol reacting with that carboxylic acid. That's the only difference. So that mirrors transesterification. So we're not going to go through that mechanism because we already saw the esterification mechanism. Right, the other reaction is here is amine formation. Right, and the, the amine is this functional group right here. You have a carbon with a double bond to nitrogen. So it's an analog of a carbonyl. It's similar to a carbonyl, but it's not the same thing. This is also called a Schiff's base. Okay. 
right? So if you see either one of those terms, ME or shift space, then uh, you'll know that that's what that's talking about. And these are the conditions, right? You need a primary amine and you need a carbonyl, aldehyde or ketone, it doesn't matter. Right? You need a carbonyl and you need a primary amine. With the amine, primary, secondary, tertiary, it's the same um, concept for amines as it is for carbon, right? So a primary amine is going to have one bond to carbon. So like this would be, if I wrote this out, if R was CH3, then this is primary. Then if I put another carbon on with one hydrogen left, then this is secondary. And then, of course, tertiary would be all carbons around that nitrogen, right? So primary, secondary, and then a tertiary amine would, would look like, oh, it's freezing up like this. Right, but in order to make uh, an amine or a shift's base, you need a primary amine. If you use a secondary amine, then you're going to end up with what's called an enamine, but I'm not going to bring that. I'm not going to discuss that. Uh, I'm trying to limit the discussion to what's on the page. All right, so we'll do that. And then the other reaction underneath for, and again, this is reactions of amines. So that's important, right? We talked about reactions of carbonyls, reactions of alcohols, uh, and then oxidation. So now we're talking about reactions of amines, all falling under the same umbrella of these final reactions, right, that we're trying to learn. The other reaction underneath there is, is amine synthesis, right? Or this is what we call Gabriel synthesis, right? So it's a way to synthesize or, or make amines. Right, and again, if functional groups don't sit well with you, when I say amine or amine or amide or ester or alcohol, if you haven't learned your functional groups and mastered those, none of this is going to make sense. And I can't teach functional groups. That's just a matter of going back and looking and looking at the functional group chart or a flashcard or an app, and you have to memorize those. Like that, there's some things in organic you memorize, there are other things you don't memorize, you just get the concept and apply it to different examples. This is a time for memorization when you're talking about functional groups. All right, so, so with the Gabriel synthesis, it's very easy to spot that because your one of your primary rea reagents is thalamate, which is this molecule right here. So you, you take thalamate, you take an alkyl halide, a strong base and water, and you end up with a primary amine in this case, and this dye acid, which is just a side product. It's normally is when I talk about this reaction, I try to exclude that because a lot of times it just confuses people. But that's just a side product from the opening of because you can see right here, this is the and I'm, I'm gonna talk about this on another page, but the nitrogen here ends up replacing the halogen here. And you can see that over here in the product. It's kind of like a, it's a substitution, but it's around, it's a very circuitous pathway to get to that substitution. So we're going to come back to that. But I'm going to go down here to uh, this reaction. Where is it? Come to pop up here, right here. All right. So that is, this is a, an example of an amine synthesis. And I want to just go through the arrows for this. All right, I want to go through the arrows for this. And you can see right here, again, anytime you're reacting a carbonyl, the carbonyl is the electrophile. And whatever you're reacting it with is going to, end, going to be your nucleophile. So this is an electrophile. This is my electrophile. The nitrogen here is going to attack that carbonyl. What am I going to get after the nitrogen attacks the carbonyl? What do I always get after a nucleophile attacks a carbonyl? What type of intermediate? Mm 
we've only said it uh, 782 times in the past two days. Uh, oh, tetrahedral. Mm -hmm. Anytime I attack a carbonyl with a nucleophile, I'm going to get a tetrahedral intermediate. Tetrahedral is just the geometry, right? It's this carbon right here with the four groups around it. You got four things attached to it. So this intermediate <clears throat> is, is the first intermediate on the way to that ME. Now, I want to get to mm -hmm. here. From here, what can I do? Let me put some electrons in up here. What can I do to get from that tetrahedral intermediate to the intermediate that I have at, at the bottom left that I highlighted? Look at what, what, well, let me ask this what's different between those two? Um, one of the H's off the nitrogen is now on the oxygen. Great. Excellent. You're 100% correct. How do I show that in chemistry language with arrows? What did I do? All right. Take I'll the hydrogen go ahead. You go ahead. Put in oxygen. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to take that hydrogen with a pair of, are you saying do this with a pair of electrons from oxygen and then break that bond to give those electrons back to nitrogen. Is that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's that called when I when I take a hydrogen from one atom and give it to another atom? It's called proton transfer, right? How do okay? So that that's going to get me here to this intermediate, and that's that's isolable, right? That's the difference in an intermediate. And a transition state is you can't isolate a transition state, but you can definitely isolate an intermediate. And this is isolable, but I don't want that. I want the ME. And this is just one step on the way to getting to the ME. So now if you look from here, I'm going to just number these. So this would be one. This is two. That's three. And this will be four. How do I get to four? What changed from three to four? Um, the same thing. One of the hydrogens came off the nitrogen and onto oxygen as well. Same thing. So it's another proton transfer. All right. So now I'm here, right? And my nitrogen is negative. And now I've I've turned that OH group <laughs> into water, which is now a leaving group. Now I can get rid of that and get to my product. What changed going from four to five? Um, there's now an aromatic ring attached, a double bond on nitrogen. Okay. And uh oh. <laughs> yeah, let me add the what you're right. Now, let me let me just not, let's take this part out, the confusion. Let's take any confusion out. This is the same as this. PH is just an abbreviation for the ring. But you're right, that did, that is different, right? But uh, the phenyl is, that's what that means. That's just an abbreviation for the uh, aromatic. But you're right, that did change. And it's visible, so, but the, but the, uh, Structural change that happened happened between nitrogen and carbon, didn't it? Well, now I have a double bond between carbon and nitrogen, and I lost water, right? So how would, in chemistry language, using curved arrows, how would I show that from four to five? I'm starting at four. I'm trying to get to five. How would I show the double bond forming and water leaving using arrows? Okay. So you're going to take... The negative, not the negative, the that carbon attached to nitrogen, mm -hmm. it's arrow there. And you're also going to push that H2O out. So I'm, I'm that makes push sense. that out like that. Is that right? <laughs> yes. And then there's an arrow going from the nitrogen to that 
carbon. Like yeah. that. Okay, good. Right? The reason that the arrows are not going the other way is because you never push electrons towards a negative charge, right? Always towards a positive. So you're going to use that pair of electrons on nitrogen to make your pi bond. And then by the same token, you're going to force out the water because that carbon that nitrogen is bonded to can't have more than four bonds to it. So you force the water out and you end up here with your imine. And again, this is a functional group and it's a common functional group and it's a highly sought after functional group, but it's fairly simple to access. One of the things that's, that's not here uh, that typically happens with this reaction is you run it uh, with um, a desiccant like mag magnesium sulfate or sodium sulfate to soak up the water that's given off. Again, every time you every time you make an ME, you lose a molecule of water. So if you have a desiccant in place, like, a, so again, mag sulfate, sodium sulfate, it's sucking the water up and it's forcing the left side of the reaction to compensate for that. That's Le Chatelier's principle again. So it's forcing the reactants to compensate for that water being absorbed by the desiccant. So it, it makes it in essence, it makes the reaction go faster. Because the more water you lose on the right side, the more react reactants have to come together on the left side to make more water because you keep losing water and you're trying to keep that equilibrium. So um, but no, yeah, no, if you're doing this in the lab and you're running it according to a procedure, more than likely you're gonna run it in the presence of like magnesium sulfate or sodium sulfate uh, as a desiccant. And it, I've done this reaction before, not this particular reaction, but I've done amine synthesis before and it is rapid. When you put that, add that desiccant, it is really, really, it's a super fast reaction. I was just about to ask how long does a reaction like this take since there are so many intermediates. You'll be you'll be surprised those intermediates are very fleeting. Uh, this I think a reaction like this I think when I did it I think it took like two hours or something like that. But that's just to ensure that the reaction goes to completion. So you run it, you add your mag sulfate, you just stir it at room temperature, and then you just let it run. It probably was done before mm -hmm. two hours. A lot of times reactions are done before the prescribed time is up. Um, and there's a way to test that. Like you can do like a thin layer chromatography throughout the, the different stages of the reaction to see where it is and see what a product is. But I didn't, I didn't do that, but it, it took about two hours because the, the one thing that, and that's a great question. I'm glad you asked that because sometimes when we see the steps on paper, we think that it may take, you know, several minutes or several hours for something to happen. But these are these reactions are rapid. Like that nucleophilic attack is rapid. Like we're talking about on a you know millisecond scale. You understand what I'm saying? And then the, the proton transfer, rapid. All of these things are really fast. They don't, it just we just see them, you know, in a static sense on the paper. But this this stuff happens like pretty fast. And there's some reactions that are much slower. But that's because they may be more endothermic or they may require a catalyst or they may, you know, have uh, some steric issues to, you know, to overcome. But, yeah, in general, a reaction like this is really fast. Like it takes no time. You can set it up, go grab a soda from the machine and come back and it's literally it's done. Uh, but that's a great question. And it's a great way to, to uh, kind of conceive of, of what's happening on the paper in, in real life, right? Because this, again, a lot of times when you do this stuff in a lab, you're following the procedure, you set it up, you, you run it, and then maybe you set up another reaction that you may have something else to do, and then you got something else going while that's, while that's going. So it's all, all about efficiency. Um. So yeah, so I'm gonna, I'm a, let's talk about this. Um, a couple of these other reactions. And then on Monday, it's just going to, and if you haven't watched the video or read this section in the chapter, you're doing yourself a disservice because on Monday, we're going to go through um, the rest of this handout. And I promise you, you, it will be much better for you if you came prepared as opposed to coming in cold and just turning off the camera and going and doing something else. 
So make sure that you either look through the syllabus and get the sections in the, in the chapter that you need to read or watch the video. Or maybe you want to watch another supplement. Maybe you're tired of my voice after four months of, you know, classes. Watch something. Do, but but you got to prepare. You can't come in cold on a section like this because it, it's just not, it's just going to go over your head if you do. Um, Let's go to here. This is a good, a good way to. Well, we'll do a couple of these multiple choice ones to kind of close out. What it, what is this reaction, and what's the pro, which product is the product? What reaction is this? I got two moles of alcohol and a keto in the presence of a ketone. That's what that two is acetone. for. That's, go ahead. I just said an acetal. Okay, acetal formation. So, which where's my product? Which one of these products is an acetal? The first one? This one. Good. Right. What about three? What is three compared to number one? We'll come back to that. Uh, let's see. We need more multiple choice questions. A couple more anyway. All right, let's let's go to here. What is uh what about that first reaction? What type of reaction is that? You have a carboxylic acid functional group and an alcohol. And I'm I'll add in um H plus as a catalyst, right? The trans esterification. Good. It's a trans esterification. All right. It's a way to turn acids into esters. So, which one of these over here is the ester product? It's not this, right? We just saw up top. That's a hemi. That's an acetal. This will be considered a hemiacetal, so it's not that. Mm, the one on the top. It's here, right? This is the ester functional group. Okay, so that's the that's the ester that you would get by taking ethanol and reacting it with that carboxylic acid. All right. What about uh let's do the last we already seen this before, right? That's gonna be another acetal formation. What about this last question right here? This is a Gabriel synthesis. The the key to understanding this reaction is to is this. Whatever the so here's my nitrogen and here's my alcohol halide. It's a substitution. The nitrogen. In that in thalamate, it's going to replace the halogen and the alcohol halide. So this is my leaving group. And then even though it's a it's a, a, a route to get to the at the final product, this is in effect my nucleophile. But I have to make it negative by adding in KOH. But the point is that I'm going to get a an amine from this, right? An amine functional group. Which one of these is going to be the product? The Gabriel synthesis is a way to make amines. The top one, the OH. That's an alcohol. This is an alkane. So is this. Right. This that was my next, my next one. Yeah, this is an amine. So even if we even if you don't know the mechanism for Gabriel synthesis, if you see thalamate in the presence of an alkyl halide, that nitrogen and thalamate is going to replace the halogen and the alkyl halide. Right? They just they don't 
directly swap out because there's some other steps in that mechanism, but that's the end result. So again, knowing your functional groups and knowing what an amine looks like, that's how you're able to predict that product, even if you don't know the mechanism. Right? It's a it's a pretty involved mechanism, so I don't want to get into the weeds on that, but we're going to uh, stop here. We're going to pick this up Monday, work through some of these reaction wheels uh, and some of the other um, reactions that are here, and then we'll be done. And the, the exam, the last exam is Monday, but I'm yeah, I'll just open it after class and I'll give you, I'll tell you the, the uh, time that you have to take it or whatever, because Monday is last day of class. And then our final, I think, is on the 13th, which is so far away. That's a lot of review time. But uh, we'll figure something out as far as doing a review and a Q&A session and all that stuff. But for now, we're going to stop. And we'll pick up Monday. Any questions?